Thank you, Ed. That's a powerful song, powerful message. Rock of Ages. And the last few words of the last stanza says, Let me hide myself in thee, because it's all about him, Amen. nothing about us. Welcome to worship today, church family, and special welcome to our visitors today. I'm glad you chose to come here today. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will touch your hearts today and give you a blessing that you need and that you can share. I would like to welcome the Ramey family today. Uh, they're, uh, they're going to be involved in our church and our school as well. So welcome. So if you don't know who they are, find them today right to worship and introduce yourself. So glad you, you chose to come here today, each and every one of you. But before I begin today, I'd like to let the Lord speak to my heart once more. Father in heaven, Lord, it's all about you, Jesus, and nothing about any one of us. And today I just pray that your Holy Spirit will crack open our hardened hearts to allow your spirit to, to widen that gap so that Jesus can flood in and it can crowd out sin, the sin that's in our lives. Thank you for what you have done, what you want to do in the future. In Jesus' holy name, amen. My message today is called Roadmap for Revival. Today I brought in a, a, a visual and someone says, wow, I hadn't seen one of those in a long time. Looks like that one has been used for quite a while. And, and that person said, I even had to buy another one because mine was worn out as well. So I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later on. But today... I want to talk to you about revival mostly. And how, how do you know what revival is? You have to know what it is before you can seek it. And you have to know how to, how to find it as well. If you look up uh, in the dictionary what revival means, it means an improvement in the condition or strength of something. It means a, re, a renewed religious interest. It also means an awakening in the church. Revival also means return. It also means renewed and more active. Today I'm going to be talking about a waymark as well. And our, and our closing hymn is going to be singing about waymarks. A waymark is a symbol or a signpost that marks your route. So when you need to take a trip... There's two things you have to understand and accept. You have to realize where you are now. We'll say that's point A. And you have to realize where you want to go. And we'll call that point B. So there's two very important things that you have to accept and understand in order to go from point A to point B. Point A is where you are. Point B is where you want to go. I can imagine, and I have a big imagination, ask my wife, I can imagine in Adam and Eve's day that Adam probably would have told Eve to go past the grove of oranges, past the blueberry bushes, and go to the apple trees, then turn left and see how many zebras are there. I'm sure that probably happened. Well, what did Eve have to do? First, she had to understand the instructions. She had to accept that that was important. She had to realize where she was at. And she had to understand where she needed to be. So her way marks on her journey to see how many zebras was there was the grove of oranges, the blueberry bushes, the apple trees, and then she had to turn left. So Leave probably said, okay, I'll do this. So she walked past the orange trees and she walked past the blueberry bushes and she came up to the apple trees and then she turned left oh wait a minute are you guys paying attention okay oh somebody got it she went past the oranges past the blueberry bushes 
to the apple trees, and then she's supposed to turn left. So she had to follow the instructions that was given to her in order to reach her final destination to see how many zebras were there. So she had way marks on the way to, to keep her on the, the right path. The oranges, the orange trees, the blueberry bushes, the apple trees, and then turn left and she'd see the zebras. So I know that's kind of a big imagination, but I can say we have to imagine things that could have possibly happened. When we get to heaven, we can ask if that really happened. Will you be willing to do that? Remember to ask that question when you get to heaven? Okay, good, good. So Eve, had to, she had to prepare. She had to remember her way marks, and she had to follow them one by one so that she could get to her final destination. So this morning, you guys made a very important decision. You decided to get up, get ready, get in your vehicle, and come to church. So on your way, you went down a road. So you, you followed the signs. You may have turned west on Interstate 40, and then you may have gotten off at exit 98 and made your way over to the church. So you followed the way marks on your way here today. You left from point A, your home, to point B here at church. Well, point B, the church here, is not your final destination. This is just a way mark to keep you on the right path so that you can reach your final destination to live with Jesus throughout eternity and to receive the blessings on the way. And we have all the information that we need to stay on that path to point B, heaven. Amen. We have every instruction that we need. Instructions and correction and encouragement. The Bible is encouragement from page to page, from, a, from the beginning to end. It's an encouragement. So stay on, the, stay on the way, Mark. Stay on the right, right path. You know, down through time, goat paths became highways. Highways became interstates. And when that happened, people began to travel. They said, hey, we're tired of point A. We want to go to point B somewhere else. So what did they do? Ah, they got out the trusty atlas. And as you see, this one has been used quite a bit. When, when Jan and I got one of these, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. Wow, it has, has all the states has all the roads. Oh, it has a list of restaurants. Uh, it has a list of, of places to spend the night. Oh, it even has sites that you can see along the way. Wow, this was fantastic. You didn't have to get that little fold-up thing that you get from state to state. This has it all. Well, we were so excited. We were so excited that we decided to plan a trip out west. Wow. So we got out the trusty atlas. We looked through it. We mapped from point A, where we were at there in Conover, North Carolina, to the Grand Canyon. That was our point B. That's where we wanted to go. So we wrote down all the roads that we had to take from state to state to state. And we saw, well, wow, we can't make it in one day. So we looked in the back and said, oh, they have motels in this city and this city and this city. Oh, there's some sites that we can see along the way. So we mapped it all out. We thought that we had it figured out. So on that morning, uh, the, to begin our trip from point A to point B, we... Uh, put all of our luggage in the vehicle and our snacks. You know, you've got to have snacks when you take a trip. So we, we make sure the car was stocked with that. And then we put in the back seat a 10-year-old and two 14-year-olds and began our journey. What were we thinking? A 10-year-old and two 14-year-olds in the back seat on a long journey which took several days 
No, I'm just kidding. It really was a great trip. It was really a great trip. And I'd recommend that you see what God has created sometime and go out west to see the Grand Canyon. It was, it was a beautiful place. So a few years later, the road atlas was replaced with this fantastic device. Wow. All you had to do was plug it into your car. And sometimes you didn't even have to plug it in. It would charge itself. GPS became available. Wow. I thought, this is it. This is fantastic. You can put in point A, and you want to go to point B. And wow, just instantly, it would tell you which way mark to look for on your journey. Wow. And you know what? It would even tell you when you got on the wrong path. Recalculating, recalculating. Wow. That is fantastic. One of our elders in our church, Al Dominic, he actually worked on the GPS system when it first was developed at IBM. If you see him sometime, ask him about that. He can tell you about his, his experience. But, wow, this was a fantastic thing to keep me on the right path so that I can reach my final destination. Fantastic. Well, after that, the GPS was replaced by our smartphones. You can do the same thing very quickly and easily and even more. So God has allowed technology to come in to help us to stay on the right path when we take journeys. But long before that, he gave us everything we need to know to stay on the most important journey of your life. So today, Roadmap for Revival. I humbly stand before you and say that we all need revival. We need revival in our personal lives. We need revival in the church. So what was revival again? An improvement or condition or strength, a return a renewed period of uh, religious interest, renewed and more active. So we all need to be doing those things to have revival. So we all stand in need of revival. You know, we need to understand that just because we have some meetings set up once or twice a year, night after night, some special singers come in and minister to us through song. Just because we do those things, it doesn't mean that we will have revival. We can bring in a great preacher, and he can preach his heart out and share the word of God. Just because we do those things doesn't mean that we will have revival. We will have genuine revival when we allow God to intercede in our, with our barriers between him and us, between him and us. When we allow God to work among us, a spiritually prepared people, when we're spiritually prepared, God can work. Our scripture reading today, Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, three through five it told us how revival can be a reality in our lives. <clears throat> Isaiah was writing about the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah's verses were partially filled in Matthew 3.3. 3. So turn your Bibles to Matthew 3.3. 3. John the Baptist is talking. He's, I'm going to start at verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths 
straight. So part of Isaiah's prophetic verses were fulfilled in, in Matthew by John the Baptist. But when Jesus comes again in his second advent, he will rule as king of kings and he will set things right in this world. So Isaiah's verses in Isaiah 43 through 5 was talking about the future. But it was also what we can call a road map for revival. They tell us that we must make preparations as a church. We must make preparations individually. If we want to see the Lord move among us in a time of power and glory and spiritual renewal. We want to see the blessings of Isaiah in verse 5. Let's look at verse 5 in Isaiah 40, verse 5. This is the blessings that we want to see. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we want the glory of the Lord revealed. We know that things will be as it's supposed to be, we will be prepared to meet our soon and coming king. Verse 4 of Isaiah 40. This talks about some things that we need to do. Some preparations that we need to do. If we make these preparations, I can't promise you that we will have revival. But I can promise you, if we do these things that the Bible is telling us to do, that revival will have a better chance to happen. These pre preparations will form that highway in the desert. So let's review what some of these preparations are. We're still in Isaiah 40, verse 4. The first part of that verse says, Every valley shall be exalted. Isaiah is referring that a filling process must happen. We all know that a valley is a, is a crevice. Uh, it's a low place. It's a gutter. So this is talking about things that are that is lacking in our lives. You know, we all have low places in our in our walk with the Lord. We have things that has brought us down to a point to where God is not supreme in our lives. We allow things that form a barrier between us and God. So we all can say that we have low spots in our walk with the Lord. We have allowed things in our life to become shallow and hollowed out. So if we want revival, these things must be filled in before revival can happen. These valleys go by many different names. For some, it's spiritual in nature. It could be prayer life. It could be reading God's word. For some, the valley could be church attendance. For some, it could be unforgiveness, something that they haven't forgiven someone for. For others, that valley could be guilt, something that has happened that they still feel guilty about. They haven't given it to God yet. For others, that valley could be anger. It could be self-righteousness. And there's, there's hundreds and thousands of other valleys that, that you can name and that I can name as well. For others, that valley could be something physical. It could be financial problems. 
that valley could be marital issues. It could be the hardships of life, your, your hardship of your life. It could be your relationship or relationships that has created that valley. And there could be hundreds or thousands more. The, second, the next part of the verse 4 says, Every mountain and hill shall be made low. Well, this is talking about a lowering process. We talked about the valley that needs to be filled up, and now we're talking about hills and mountains, mountains that needs to be lowered in our lives. A mountain or hill is something that stands taller than the landscape around it. This is talking about barriers or roadblocks in our lives that have the potential to hinder revival from coming our way. There are many potential barriers in our revival lives, such as jealousy, lust, it could be pride, unfaithfulness, hindering relationships, it could be worry, that's a big one. It could be disobedience to the will of God. If God speaks to you and we don't obey, that's disobedience. That could be that mountain or hill that's the barrier between you and real revival. We all have mountains in our lives. I know I do. So I'm not preaching to each and every one of you individually. I'm preaching to myself as well. And I just pray that you let the Holy Spirit, through the reading of God's Word, reveal to you what those mountains might be in your life. We all have attitudes and actions and passions that need to be brought down so that God can move in as He desires. Sometimes I travel on I-26 from North Carolina into Tennessee. And if you've ever been that direction, you, you can see off in the distance where uh, the road people have taken down huge mountains so that the road can go through much easier. And they took all that rock and dirt and they filled in the valleys below. You can see that off in the distance what, what they did. So we need to allow, allow God to take down those mountains that we have in our lives and fill in our valleys as well. So when the mountains are brought down, the low places are filled in. So let us all look at our lives today and identify those high places that stand as barriers between you and your Lord. Continuing in verse 4, it says, The crooked places shall be made straight. The word crooked comes means that it's something deceitful, it could be something sly or something just crooked or slippery. It speaks about a road that is very deceptive in nature. We all have traveled on roads that uh, we didn't travel before, and it appears like in a short distance you'll reach your point B. But once you get on that crooked, slippery road, it may wander, it may meander, it may take you long ways around to get to where you wanted to go. So we've all been on those uh, crooked paths. It might be something that you have allowed the devil to magnify in your life that makes your, your pathway to heaven crooked now. But we do have something that tells us to recalculate. It's God's word. Many times you don't know you're on that crooked road until you're really far away from your destination. Ask God every day to reveal to you his will for you and your lives that day. And he will. He's a God who loves you and who wants to keep you not on a crooked path, but on a straight path. Some other things that may have kept you on that crooked path could be work, 
It could be recreation. There's many other things that keeps you on that crooked path. Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, if you're on that path, that's very dangerous. It's when someone believes that they know what's right for everyone else. If you're on that road, please ask God to get you off that road. Tell him to humble your heart. Tell him to speak to you, and he will. Pride is a, a crooked path as well. Many of us refuse to bow down and let God be the, the God. Let God be God. Let him be the Lord of your lives. And he will take that pride from you. Worldliness is another crooked path. We talk about how the world has, has drawn our young people away from, from God and from church. It is true. But the world's also pulling each and every one of us away. It tugs on us day by day. Our church, some, some cases have become a little bit more worldly. Stay with God's roadmap. We cannot fail if we stay with God's roadmap. Another part of verse 4 says, The rough places smooth. I work for Bracket Brothers Lumber. We have a planer. We take rough lumber and run it through the planer, and it has very sharp knives that spins. And when that piece of lumber comes out, those sharp knives have taken off the roughness. That timber becomes smooth. We need to allow God to take all the roughness out of our lives. There's things that are rough or doubtful or maybe questionable. These rough places could be places where we know what we should do, but we don't. Allow God to make these places smooth. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. You become what you surround yourself with many times. It's hard to stay focused on what is important if we allow the world to pull us out into many of those different things. So we all have places in our life that's rough. I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I take a mile when God says, don't even take an inch. We allow things like gossip, envy, anger, unforgiveness, laziness, hatred, bad temper, prayerlessness, impurity and talk, negative thoughts and impure motives. And there's thousands of, of others. These are rough places in our life that we need to say, God... Playing them down for me. Make them smooth in my life so that I can be who you want me to be, not who I want to be. So we have all those rough places in our walk with the Lord. Let him smooth them out for you today. Let him smooth them out so that real revival can take place. If real revival came... Do we know what it would look like? Like I said before, it wouldn't be just a few days of meetings and then forgotten forever. That wouldn't be real revival. If real revival came to this church or to you individually, would, would every one of us accept it? No. 
Because if real revival, real revival came, we know that we would have to let things change. And many people are not willing to let things change. Real, real revival messes things up for those who are unwilling to change. So what would real revival look like? Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Starting in verse 42. Acts 2, 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think that would be real revival. I also think that real revival would look like what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Turn over to Acts 4, 31. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That would be real revival. I think real revival would look like Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. So we'll turn over to Acts 5, 12 through 14. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. That would be real revival. Acts 8 Chapter 8, verse 8, also tells us that we know that real revival has come. This was a period of time when Saul was persecuting the church. I'm going to start up at verse 4. Acts 8, verse 4 through 8. Therefore, those who were scattered and went everywhere preaching the word. The church was being persecuted, so they scattered, but they were preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. That's what they were preaching. They were preaching Christ. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There is joy when Christ is preached by everyone. Each and every one of us can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he soon returned with boldness and with joy. When real revival comes, it will make the church look a lot like the New Testament model. It will make it look more like the model than it does now. 
Real revival will impair us for God's work. It will impassion us to reach the lost. It will give us excitement to worship the Lord. Real revival will instruct us in holiness. So the big question for you today is, is real revival possible? Amen. It is. I believe it is possible. It will be made possible when we follow his road map and prepare the way for him to come, to come in power and glory. Amen.